So, right, just to be clear, when we say alien rocks at Avebury, we don't mean kryptonite from Krypton on planet Earth. We mean cobbles from up north in prehistoric Wiltshire. Still with us? Stick around. <laughs> so, cobbles from up north, what on earth do we mm. mean? And at Avebury, what do mm. we mean by that? It's full of surprises, this story, isn't it? It's lovely, actually. On so many levels, it's lovely. Yes. Um, uh, we're looking uh, West Kennet, really, aren't we? Which is uh, yeah. uh, south of Avebury a little bit. Yeah. And they have found stones, small stones, they're only pebble size, uh, in some of the pits at West Kennet. Uh, that they, and these stones came from nearly 300 miles away. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's really very exciting. It's like uh, they can't have come by accident. People brought them. So Avebury, down in Wiltshire, um, not far away from Silbury Hill. In fact, you can see the site where mm. these rocks were found from Silbury Hill or from West Kennet Longbarrow. Um, hopefully I've got a little mm -hmm. map up on the screen so you know, we've got an idea of where it ca came from. And there's a lot more to this story. And we're going to launch off and talk directly about the stones. But there's a backstory to this concerning the complex that the stones were, were found in. But we'll do that towards the back end of this, um, this little show so we don't mm -hmm. get bogged down in, in too much detail. Yeah, so who who found them? You know, the excavation when these were found was done in uh, summers of 2019 and 2021, I think. Um, was it? I think it was 21. I think they missed out 20, I think didn't they, they, because of I COVID? I think they did because of COVID. Yeah. Uh, that, is, yeah. that is quite correct. And they were investigating a small area of what you know, is called the uh, West Kennet palisaded enclosures, which we will talk more about along, but a bit of it called Structure 5, which is a really quite a small area of that whole um, thing, which is a load of uh, timber enclosures, enormous timber enclosures. But this one you know, is just a small part of it. And so their socks were knocked off on two counts, really. A, you know, the strange rocks that they found, and B, the intensity of the and depth of the timber posts that they were, were finding in this small area, uh, and the speculations are about you know what's uh, whether it was a square building, round building, you know w what the whole purpose, and of course weird things with the dating. But the rocks, how many of them were found altogether? Seventy-seven. Uh, Seventy-seven. And was it seven of those were actually associated with a, a, a burial? They were in a circle around a small burial, yes. Yeah, which um, in turn was yeah. in in the top of one of the huge uh, uh, post holes uh, in this area. Yes. Uh, as as were some of the, yes. lots of the other rocks, you know, tended to be in the tops of these um, uh, post holes, which uh, it seems have been there for some time. But more of that anon. <laughs> yeah. So there aren't any secure dates to this, but we're looking at anything from 2005 to 2300 BC. Is that correct? Yes, yes. I mean, it's it's a multi-period overall. It's a multi-period site that people clearly have been living there for a very, very, very long time. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yes, these uh, th these stones are associated with uh, with the uh, the later um, uh, inclusions. It's, it's it is it's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. They're in the tops of uh, not necessarily the top, but close to the tops of these uh, of these post holes. So not when the timber posts were there, it would seem. It's it's like reuse to have a burial, for example in one of those pits that used to contain a post. That's quite interesting. The uh, archaeologists involved, uh, have you got their names to hand there? Uh, Josh Pollard. In front of me? No, are you talking about the original? We've got Josh Pollard. Mark um, Gillings, Ben Chan, and, Rosamond uh, Cleal, uh, Stu Eve, uh, yeah, uh, Joshua Pollard. Um, now, the uh, interesting aspects were, they 
don't have the skills. They're archaeologists. <laughs> <laughs> they have their own set of skills before anybody starts saying, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But petrology is very, very particular. Yeah. And there are two pe gentlemen in particular whose names rise to the uh, top uh, here. And we're talking about um, um, Rob Ixa and Richard Bevins. They're the pair that have been analysing the, the uh, Welsh uh, bluestones uh, at Stonehenge and have um, uh, definitively... Um, found uh, through the, their petrology that uh, not only the general area of where the bluestones come from, but, you know, the particular quarry sites where they, uh, uh, they've come from. So it's, uh, it's Rob Ixer and Richard Bevins who are on this case as well. Shall I just read what they themselves say um, uh, about these, these rocks? Um, hopefully, just that, that brief, that brief, brief intro. Yes, yeah, do yeah. It, it, it kind of gives it a context. Yes. So they say at first sight, samples from the West Kennet excavations, um, samples from the West Kennet excavations, raising the size from heavily weathered cobbles to sand grains, look like sandstone, very friable, coarse grain, greenish grey, micaceous. Is that how you pronounce it? And arcosic, rich in feldspar, apparently rich in feldspar. However, as they showed spheroidal onion skill weathering, typical of igneous rocks, with we thin sectioned them for routine petrographical analysis. To our surprise, this showed that this feldspathic sandstone was not sedimentary, but a highly altered igneous rock with an unusual composition. It was grus. The coarse sand and gravel that results from intense weathering and decomposition of granitic rocks. And it's not native to Wiltshire. <laughs> That's the thing. No. It is no, not uh, at all. Exotic. Very exotic to Wiltshire, if taken in the, you know, whole mm. context of the of Britain. I was just gonna say it is breathtaking. The lengths to which they went to isolate where these stones could have come from. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, it's astonishing, actually. The, the uh, chemical analysis down to the most incredible degree to make sure that it wasn't this outcrop from Scotland and it wasn't that outcrop from the Lake District. Uh, it, 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 it's breathtaking work how they pinned it down. Yeah, and we wouldn't pretend to understand a word of it because it's full of... <laughs> <laughs> full of <laughs> well, one or two, one, well, one or two, or two may, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but it is hinged on particular <laughs> processes in petrology and 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 chemical and being able to identify the component parts of uh, you know and, and well, mm. the nomenclature is beyond our ken. However, that said, one of the major major uh, parts in discerning which outcrop or which outcrops uh, are most favourable to be the origin of these rocks is actually dating. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a technique involving, uh, involving uh, the levels of zircon in whatever samples uh, you take, and apparently uh, by lead uranium, or is it uranium lead dating, uh, the zircon component can be dated. We're talking now about rocks, so we're talking about millions and millions and millions of years. So one of the favoured sites for the origins of this... 400 million, ...was the roughly. Lake District. Uh, yeah, it was, it was um, the, the Lake District, but it turned out uh, from this analysis that uh, the Lake District was... <laughs> that rock was uh, 40 million years too early for it to be this. So... The only candidates left were rocks from the Cheviot Hills. And do, am I pronouncing Cheviot right? Is it Cheviot? Yes. Hills. It oh. is. Okay, cool. Do you know what? I've always said Cheviot. <laughs> Cheviot. Okay, fair enough. Uh, up north, 280 miles away from where we're talking about now uh, in Northumbria. Yeah. And in particular, they think they may have narrowed it down to uh, an outcrop called Cunyon Crags. So that's, those are the basic facts 
We haven't left anything out about that, have we, really? Not the matters from this context, I don't think, you know. And, per, and nondescript apart from that. That's probably the most important aspect of this, isn't it? The fact that they are just a nondescript stone. It means that, uh, okay, you can't say any of this with with certainty. You can only go with what feels logical, really, that people mm. were bringing these stones from one place to a new place. And mm. uh, the fact that they are just, they're not even pretty stones in any way. They're not any particular size. It's just they've brought a piece of a place to a place. So it's the fact that it's the place that mattered, not the pretty stone. Um, and that, it's, you know, we've talked about, oh, at length, people have talked about, you know, how it's been proven that the, the blue stones at Stonehenge came from the Priscilla's. So there was this thing about taking a place to a place. And yeah. so now to have this thing where these little stones have been taken by people that mm. uh, it, it's a, it puts it on a personal level. It's not this industrial level of, of taking an entire, you know, collection of massive stones somewhere. It's where, you know, even children could have put these things in their pockets and carried them to mm. a, a new place. I find that so evocative and romantic. Mm. Uh, you know, what was going on? Um, uh, my understanding is that Outside of, uh, so where we're talking about, um, you know, at the West Kennet Palisades, Structure 5, as Michael said earlier on, Structure 5 is just a small structure uh, within this complex. And mm. uh, my understanding is that none of the grus, these small stones, none of them have been found outside of uh, Structure 5. Now, no, right. That's that correct. again... Uh, you know, uh, and it, let me add to that that the rest of the enclosures have been very well excavated. So, uh, although there's a possibility that some may be missed, but the, uh, what uh, Rupert just said stands, uh, that uh, it, it, they haven't been found elsewhere in the uh, in the environs. Yeah. Sorry, Rupert, carry on. And no, that's all right. So, so you know, what are we talking about... Uh, a family or a small social group moving to, you know, a, a, you know, is it a new home? Obviously, we couldn't possibly know these things, other than the fact that it is mm. so isolated or, uh, uh, you know, discreet in this one place. These stones from two hundred and eighty miles away. Yeah, it's amazing. Let me just uh, dispel with something that you know some people may be thinking. They're, they're going, oh well, it could easily have been transported by glaciation. Well, not so mm. fast, um, uh, because even if... I mean, it's a possibility uh, that these stones could have been part of a glacial till that was shoved down uh, you know, Britain, what... Uh, it would have been, what, 8,000 years before we're talking about the, the, the age... 8,000, 10,000 years before the age we're talking about right now. At least. But the glaciation only reached, even then, uh, didn't reach into Wiltshire. I'm trying to think of the. I'm trying to think of the boundaries exactly where um, the, the glaciation reached, but my thing with whether glaciation or not, it would still have needed human element to get the stones the rest of the way. But even with that, how? Why would you? Why would you? I mean, it's one one thing alone to say. Why would you take the bring these stones all the way from their source where they could were in one place? By the time these stones have been tilled and churned over in glacial till coming all those miles, they'll have been completely randomised with the rest of the till picked up by the glacier. Why would you mm. spend time seeking out these nondescript uh, lumps of rock from the other lumps of rock in glacial till to bring them? Mm. Then That's even a weirder mm. question than having mm. brought them uh, stock and barrels. I, I, th uh, I think you're absolutely all the way. right. And, you know, the, 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 you know, obviously the researchers have to, uh, have to put that in, you know, to say that, okay, this is possible as well. Uh, but, uh, but when you think about it logically, that if something had been transported, as Mike was just saying, if, if something's been transported by glaciation 
and all mixed up and scattered. And now you're looking for those to take them somewhere else, as opposed to, no, they really did come from 280 miles away at this outcrop. Because then mm. if, if it was an outcrop where people were living, say, then th they would just each have picked up a stone that was right by their feet. They don't have to go looking for them across the landscape. Uh, you know, it's it's right that yeah. you feed in the possibility, but, um, but, you know, it's not likely, I don't think. So we can't learn from this what people were actually thinking that had them bring these stones. But what is fascinating about this is that it's another feather in the cap of thinking in terms of the interconnectedness and the amount to which people were travelling uh, back, back, way, way, way back in time. We've got so much evidence of movement, trade and uh, exchange. We've got bluestones from Wales going to Stonehenge. We've got two out of the five people buried in the stage one of Stonehenge. Two out of the five people buried there were from, from Wales. Um, the West Kennet yeah. Palisaded enclosures, two of the pigs that have been excavated or bones from pigs excavated there, seems they had their uh, origins um, in, in Wales uh, somewhere, um, or, in, mm -hmm. or indeed the, the Lake District. Um, there's a f massive flint core. You've got that core flint, flint core. That was found yeah, I was in one of the ditches yeah. uh, uh, nearby uh, that is provenanced from Norfolk, most likely Grimes Graves. Flint, you know, what's that yeah. doing there? How did it get there? It's a big, big <laughs> piece. I've seen it. It's in the uh, Stonehenge exhibition yeah. at uh, the British Museum. It's big, heavy. <laughs> it's a big piece. Um, arrow it's yeah, a big yeah. piece. Arrowheads. It's from Bridlington, yes. Yeah, well, the style, matching the style, yeah. And possibly, stone-wise, possibly from, uh, from around the same location as the, uh, as the Gris came from as well, uh, which is uh, another interesting uh, aspect there. And yeah. then uh, the, the pottery, there was uh, grooved yeah. ware from Rudston. Well, it matches the style. It matches, it's not actually, not actually from... Not actually from Rudston. Rudston, obviously, is um, uh, it's home to uh, Britain's tallest standing stone. Not to mention a number of cursus uh, monuments in the landscape as well. It was, you know, a complex place. So it, it's it's a clear, very very clear marker that people were travelling uh, from far and wide to come to uh, West Kennet. I think that's the main takeaway from all of this, uh, I think. And I, I think although we, it's a wonderful playground for speculation as to why people would <laughs> bring lumps of rock from Northumbria to Wiltshire. Uh, yeah, we'll do you know what? You say that, that. You say one. that. But, I, I, uh, but don't you think, though, that we, we don't stop doing it now? The fact is that now we have industrialised making of, of nonsense Every time we go anywhere, we buy souvenirs and we bring them home. We go on holiday, we yeah. bring a you know, whatever it is. We we buy something from somewhere and take it back home. Uh, and yeah. so you're talking about a time when well, people weren't there. There weren't shops and service centers, service stations for buying all sorts of nonsense. They took stuff somewhere else from. You know, it it just makes sense to me. It'll always remain speculation. Is my point as to what people's relationship to these particular stones may have been you see they may have been they may have had a practical use all knowledge of which has gone you know and and so we'll never be able to discern uh, you know if we if if there were the material bags that contained them were there we might be able to have a guess if if, if the, you know what whatever container they, they were in that kind of thing. They may have been practical rather than sentimental, even though we must remember that seven of them were used to mark uh, at this grave or celebrate this grave or whatever. So, mm. yeah, th that's enough about stones. We can't say enough, uh, any more about the Grus. Um, no. Oh, are it's we saying that word, It's just a very romantic right? thing. Is it, is it, yeah. is it, is it Grus? Grus or... Is it it's even in gross. It's not. It, no, if it was gross, it would be two S's. I know, I know. But it could be. It's conceivable that it's <laughs> grew. It's conceivable that it's grew. 
Tumbleweed. That's true. <laughs> But we've never heard it spoken, so True. It's, it's going to be gross. It's going to be gross. Except if you're suggesting that it came from the French, which would make it gru, then uh, you, uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's not. <laughs> no, no, we're not going to come to any conclusions that, no. here. So I think uh, I think we'd better uh, move on. Um, so that's enough about the stones. Um, I don't know if we've left enough time to talk about the the palisaded enclosures and uh, the background to them. Um, I, I think best we can do is sort of um, rather than us try to describe them here is give you enough sort of a little bit of a background so you can go off and, and find out for yourselves uh, about the palisaded uh, enclosures. Um, yeah, you, you, we're taking a deep breath there to ready yourself for a concise description of what we're talking about. The well, uh, the palisaded enclosures. All right, so uh, so you have potentially these very tall timber posts uh, that are sunk a long way into the ground. In some cases, they're sunk three meters into the ground. I mean, yeah. that is a lot. That's a huge depth to make sure that they don't slip. Um, and the interesting thing here is that they're they're close set. They don't butt to each other. They're close set. Um, now, this is maybe not the time to go into our rationale about that, but you know, no. it's an interesting feature that you could walk between these posts. They weren't mm. butted tight together. Yeah. Um, the uh, uh, the eastern of the two main palisades, uh, uh, one of them crossed the River Kennet, um, which is interesting. The western uh, the western enclosure is just to the south of yeah. the Kennet. They're both of them very, very close to how the many, uh, How many yards across uh, do you reckon the, uh, the, is to give people Ooh, a sense of scale? I can't remember off the top of my head. They're big. Mm -hmm. They're big enclosures. I mean, they're the size of Avebury almost, aren't they? Yeah, um, yeah. About 300 uh, yards I across. I mean, they, that, some, something like that. It's, 300 uh, yards? Yeah, uh, it's yeah. big. They are big. But, and there are all sorts of complications. There's straight rows, you know, there are smaller circles, smaller in, uh, enclosures, uh, signs of habitation, uh, obviously. But it, it's, it's a, there's something controversial about the dating, which we won't go, again, won't go into now. But it seems if the dating is right, this whole complex has been in use in one way or another over a very long period. And it's so interesting that it's just, you know, I was going to say stones throw <laughs> from from Avebury, from Silbury Hill, from West Kennet. Very Lombard, good. From yeah. um, the Ridgeway, the prehistoric trackway, you know, that heads up to uh, yeah. the north up there, and from the Sanctuary, uh, which is the other monument um, just over to the northeast. Yeah. I think it's fair to say... Um, what was the word that you used? Controversial? Did you say the dating? The dating. What Not the controversial, but dis what? but uh, debatable, what should we say? Well, I, I see, because I, I think that the, uh, the, the qualifier for me is that, uh, that uh, the reason that it's controversial in, uh, or, or it's been considered uh, controversial is because the dating was unexpected. Yeah. Uh, to my mind, we shouldn't be surprised by it because, you know, as we said before, what it, what it shows is that people were living in that one place for a very, very long period of time. Hmm. Um, it was just previously it was expected that all the dating would come in, you know, at around, you know, a date. Hmm. But it's actually, uh, you, know, there's, uh, you know, there's like a thousand years unexpected shift. Um, yeah. uh, so I find that... Uh, uh, not surprising at all, yeah. <laughs> frankly. But we're getting into the weeds here, you know, getting into the long grass because we can't get into the background behind all this, behind all the dating, you know, in, in the small amount of time that, that we've got. My advice would be, you mm. know, to have a good Google search about West Kennet uh, Palisades and, and the whole thing mm. um, uh, and, and find out the details for yourself. It is unquestionably um, one of the most important um, uh, complexes uh, I, I won't use the word monument but you know what I mean 
uh, structures, I think, that's going to tell us a lot about prehistory, you know, in, in the end of the Neolithic, mid-Neolithic and towards the end of the um, Neolithic and the beginning of the, of the Beaker period, you know, depending on what comes out of the archaeology. All that said, all it tells to me, and, you know, we'll like to have your feedback on this, but it makes me feel, I think, Rupert, you feel the same, that the uh, the the whole subject of the Avebury complex, when you include everything, is probably going to be more telling if more stuff comes out of it. It's going to be more telling than the whole of the Stonehenge complex. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, yeah. There's so many mm. varied aspects to this whole area that aren't quite present at, at Stonehenge. Mm. Stonehenge tends to get a little, little bit of a, a narrow focus, you know, what, Durrington Walls, mm. yeah, but Blue Stones, yeah, but uh, th there seems to be a breadth of, uh, of subject matter to be encompassed at Avebury that we'd love to actually do something yes. about. So, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> will that happen? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. There, there is a, a lot to a lot to be uh, dug up about that. Apologies for that, but uh, there is a lot to be dug up. Certainly true, uh, and it does, yeah. as we said before, it just shows that people were travelling from far and wide to come to uh, Avebury, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and that in itself is exciting. How much people were getting around back yes. then. Mm. So, as you rightly said, there is much to be dug up, and we mm. dig deeper so you don't have to. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> How cheesy are we? <laughs> uh, let us leave it there. Thank you so much for watching, everybody, uh, and for mm. listening, of course, if you're on audio only. I uh, hope you found that interesting and illuminating mm. a little bit, uh, and uh, hope you find there's uh, fruit for further investigations. With that, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Bye.